program. So you want to just, we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, we have a full agenda, so. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, Preservation Virginia's CEO. I hope each of you and your families are staying safe and warm in this wintry weather. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce today's program and its talented panel. It made my heart glad to see the list of attendees last night. Friends are joining from all over Virginia, folks we usually see in person at these gatherings, as well as participants from North Carolina, Delaware, Maryland, DC, Tennessee, New Jersey, South Carolina, and Florida. We thank you for your continued participation. Today's webinar is part of a series of educational programming organized by Preservation Virginia. And I encourage you to visit our website and our YouTube channel to learn more of that programming and including a recording of today's session. Before I introduce our participants, we have a few housekeeping tips. The session is 75 short minutes and we have a lot to get to in that, that time period. We've allowed for an hour for presentations, <clears throat> about 15 minutes for questions and wrap up. To keep to our timetable, we'll introduce panelists at the beginning and we'll hold questions to the end. To ask a question, um, please locate the menu bar at the bottom of the screen. You can type your question um, into the Q&A block. Genevieve Keller, our board chair, will moderate the Q&A with panelists and will respond to as many um, questions as time allows. In 2013, the educational centers funded through the inspired leadership of Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald were nominated to Virginia's list of most endangered historic places. More than 380 Rosenwald schools were built in Virginia between 1917 and 1932 and operated until the 1970s in desegregation. Afterwards, many of these schools lay dormant and neglected, but their alumni, teachers, and communities never forgot the powerful role um, that these places had in providing a pathway to education. With funding from the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, we worked with communities to identify, survey, and document the schools found and built in 86 counties and four cities across the Commonwealth. The survey found that 126 of these structures remained on, the land, on their landscapes and in various use. Beginning in 2014, we've been honored to organize regular convenings of individuals and groups dedicated to preserving Virginia's Rosenwald schools, to share experiences, stories, and lessons learned. This webinar is just a window into the history and historic sites of Virginia's African Americans and indigenous people. That, have, that has been for far too long suppressed, excluded, misrepresented, and undervalued in the traditional narrative. Preservation Virginia believes that the resources of our past offer vital lessons about all facets of our complex history. Such lessons may be sobering, inspiring, or troubling, and preservation efforts must strive to capture and not gloss over these complexities. Over the last decade, we've helped build awareness through our annual Most Endangered listings and our awards program. Our public policy efforts are supporting legislation and budget items that, have help, that are helping to save, preserve, and fund resources, including sites and landscapes of African American and Virginia Indian history. We've worked uh, tirelessly with our allies to advocate for solutions to preserve places, including Shaco Bottom and the African Burying Ground, Rossowick, Pine Grove, Shaco Hill Burying Ground, and the James River. We organize educational offerings at our sites and with our community partners and gatherings, now that we've made virtual webinars like this, to share tools, stories, and broaden the scope of history that is recognized. We're working to ensure there is broader representation on our board and our staff team 
to reflect the diversity that is Virginia's history and support pipelines for, for, for professional and volunteer opportunities. We need to do more. And Preservation Virginia is committed to ensuring that placemaking and equity are at the heart of our work. Our panelists today share that common goal. And I'll introduce them briefly um, at, to, uh, for time's sake, but I really encourage you to visit our blog on our website where we'll post their full bios. Um, this is an amazing group of people. Our first speaker is Reverend Millicent Nash, a native of Campbell County and an ordained minister, educator, and community activist. She presently serves as the chairperson of the Campbell County Training School Complex Committee. This, Reverend Nash has spearheaded this organization for six years. Following Reverend Nash, Colleen Beatty and Dr. Wesley C. Wilson will share their work at the Woodville Rosenwald School. Ms. Beatty is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel. Um, currently, she is working on a project through her archaeological concerns, excavating late 19th and early 20th century Black schools, specifically Rosenwald schools. Dr. Wesley C. Wilson retired as an Army avi avi aviator as Lieutenant Colonel after 20 years of service to our country. He earned a master's in counseling and a doctorate in historical research, both from the College of William and Mary. Dr. Wilson is the founder of the Woodville Rosenwald School Foundation, established in 2013. Next, we'll be joined by Muriel Miller Branch. She grew up in rural Cumberland County, Virginia. Uh, Ms. Branch attended Pine Grove Elementary School in the Pine Grove community, um, as did her, fa her father and siblings. Her mission is to protect and preserve Pine Grove School and the beloved Black community that sustained the school and nurtured her. And um, I might say I've seen Ms. Branch quite frequently in the General Assembly session doing just that to preserve these places. Following Ms. Branch, Curtis Valentine will share his work as a member of the Board of Directors of the Rosenwald Park Campaign. Mr. Valentine is a descendant of the co-founders of the Carol Boyd Rosenwald School in Bra Bracey. He serves as Deputy Director of the Progressive Policy Institute's Reinventing American Schools Project and he currently serves as an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland, College Park. Next, we'll, be, we'll welcome our friend Justin Reed, who serves as the State Director of Community Initiatives at the Virginia Humanities. He helps fund and promote cultural education and preservation partnerships across the Commonwealth, as well as managing the General Assembly's African American Cultural Resources Task Force. He previously worked at the Moton Museum, a National Historic Landmark um, in his hometown of Farmville and the site of some of our earlier uh, Rosenwald gatherings. Megan J. Brown will follow. She has worked at the National Park Service for 17 years, starting as a grants management specialist and then spending 10 years as a certified local government coordinator and now serves as the chief of the state tribal, local, plans, and grants division. Luana Holland Moore, another great friend from the National Trust, is the Associate Program Officer of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, the National Trust's multi-year uh, initiative to identify, elevate, and support the voices of African American activism and achievement. She offers her expertise as a historian and journalist to a variety of organizations, including the Landmarks Committee of the DC Preservation League, White House Historical Society, National Trust Diversity and Inclusion Group, um, representing the Decatur House and more. And Jim Hare will join us for the Q&A. He's the Director of Special Projects for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, a native of Denver, um, and prior to joining DHR's staff in 2014, he directed several historic preservation nonprofit organizations, 
including the National Trust for Scotland Foundation USA, Historic Corps, and Cornerstones Community Partnership. And Genevieve Keller, our current chair of the Board of Preservation Virginia and founding principal of uh, the preservation practice firm of Land and Community Associates will lead our Q&A. Before uh, the Reverend Nash begins her uh, presentation, I would also like to just give a virtual applause to Sonia Ingram, who's organized today's webinars are just as hard as in-person events. So we appreciate all of Sonia's work. So Reverend Nash. Well, good morning to uh, the host of the Art Preservation of Virginia and to the panelists and to the attendees. It is indeed an honor for uh, the Campbell County Training School uh, Committee to be represented here today. So uh, Sonia is gonna assist me with the uh, presentation as we go over to our slides. Uh, the first three slides has to do with uh, just introduction. Um, uh, I am, as I said, the chairperson of the committee. So Sonia, as you move on up, and then we have our um, board of directors. And this is our, the board of directors from the beginning to our current board of directors who work tirelessly to make sure that uh, that which we are doing is done decent and in order. Okay, move up please. As you see, this is a uh, view of the school. The reason we call it a complex is because we have four of the original buildings on the site. Uh, this was taken in 2015, both the aerial view and the uh, the cameos of each building. Uh, okay, I want to read you just our mission statement and our vision, and it is to promote historical preservation awareness while establishing programs that encourage educational training opportunities for all. And the vision is to rehabilitate or renovate all of the buildings on the CCTSC complex site for public and private use. Uh, Sonia. Okay. As you see, it's to develop uh, the uh, partnerships that uh, from private and uh, public resources and to, uh, of course, receive grants and money and to develop planning and implementation of our goals. Go okay, our motto, to interpret the past, preserving the present and educating the future. That's our motto. These are our visionaries. Things that I wanna share with you with our visionaries. The first one, Reverend Tweedy and Gay Hunt, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Hunt was an ex-slave and uh, they continuously went before the Board of Education to um, create a school in Rustburg, Virginia. Uh, they mortgaged their homes uh, for $500 to fin financially support the beginning structures of uh, the Campbell County Training School. Reverend Tweedy became the first pr uh, principal of the school and Mr. Hunt, as I said, was an ex-slave and he worked in the uh, Rustburg courthouse area for many, many years. Neither of these uh, visionaries had children, but they uh, understood how important education was. Okay. From the, the, I think the next five slides, I believe, we're gonna, it, it will show the steps that we took to legitimize ourselves. We began to plan, uh, we created uh, bylaws, established our bank account, uh, we got state incorporation, our state incorporation papers, 
And then we were fortunate to have a, a more architectural firm lay out a roadmap for us uh, that we followed. And even up to today, we, are, we have completed that uh, path that they created for us. Of the year, we will uh, install that uh, land, the highway marker on our property to let uh, the passersby know that uh, this is indeed a place to be. Uh, continue. <clears throat> we have developed our relationships with our county officials, and I think that that is very important. Uh, from the very beginning, we found that uh, as we work with our local government, it is, uh, um, and let them know what we are expecting. And they also let us know what they are expecting from us. And so that relationship has been very um, instrumental in getting us where we are today. Um, they eventually, uh, uh, deeded the property to us free of charge. And uh, for that, we are grateful. Continue, please. These are some of the things that we have participated in and completed uh, during the six years that we have been in operation, especially uh, as we plan we started out having two board meetings per month. Uh, then we uh, decided only last year that maybe we could go to meeting. And of course, because of COVID-19, we are now doing our meetings over the telephone. So we have not stopped. We are continuous in our efforts. Okay. Um, we have accomplished much. We attended three, uh, uh, we, ha we have as an organization um, uh, done three retreats. We attended the National uh, um, Trust uh, for Historic Preservation, their uh, retreat for board, uh, uh, for board members, their training sessions. We were one of five schools that they chose to participate in their training program, both uh, the initial training and the advanced training. So I think that that, again, helped our organization uh, propel to where we are now. Okay. Uh, as you see, we are now, we have our uh, national, the par National Park Service uh, designation. We have a Virginia Landmark uh, designation. Uh, all of the things that I believe that makes an organization legitimate, uh, such as the, our DUNS number, our 501c3 status, and all of that, we uh, try to do that ahead of time. So that as we are uh, now recipients of uh, larger amounts of money, uh, of grant money, uh, that is important. And uh, I think that uh, as we move forward, uh, we'll learn more. Uh, we'll do things perhaps a little differently, but our structure is in place to handle that. Um, and that... Uh, kind of let you know, oh, we were uh, even featured this month in the Cooperative uh, Living Magazine. It's a very good article. We were featured alongside of Maxine Nallen, who is in uh, uh, Cortland, Virginia. And her connection with us is that her, her um, husband also attended the Campbell County Training School. So we met uh, her through uh, Preservation of Virginia. So you can see here that there's the slides are very, um, uh, you can see what happened during that time. That's what the buildings look like. Uh, this is what they look like today. OK. 
Okay, go. Uh, this is the interior work. That's our crew, uh, which are our, our committee members. Okay. This is the interior. That's the exterior of one of our, our office buildings. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, that's what it looks like today. Love the floors. I went to Piney Grove uh, several years ago and uh, their floors were just magnificent. And uh, we wanted our floors to look just like theirs. So uh, going to the last slide, we participate in uh, community activity. And this is a flyer from our last fundraiser, which was held in 2020 before COVID hit. So uh, that's our presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Nash. Um, and if you haven't seen the Cooperative Living Magazine, look for it. Um, we'll see if there's a link and we can post it in the chat, but um, it's a great article. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have Colleen Beatty and Dr. Wilson. Thank you. I'll start off and then hand the baton to uh, Colleen shortly. I would, um, I have a work for me to share the screen. It did in practice. <laughs> Okay, maybe I, I got to hit all the right buttons, I guess. Um, I'm going to take you through a, a quick virtual walk of our school. And um, we're very proud of where we are right at uh, the moment and even looking forward to where we're going to be uh, in the future. What, what you see here on this, on this screen is uh, our designation or of being in the natural uh, reservation uh, registry. And um, we will be receiving our highway marker shortly. It's been approved and be, it's in, we'll get it within the next month or two, uh, will be delivered. So we're looking forward to that. I'm sharing here a kind of a bird's eye view of the school. And i uh, just quickly share with you for those familiar with these. We are a typical Rosenwald class, two classroom uh, facility. We have six of these in the county, had six, because this is the, the one we're sharing with you, is the last remaining. We had six of the two teacher schools, uh, one of the training school, and a teacher's home. We recently discovered that the training school was actually used by the county as a six room classroom and built a couple of other buildings next to it, which we were going to be exploring uh, as soon as the weather gets a little bit better. What happened in 1943, the school board decided that they no longer needed the property and uh, so they sold it to a private developer who converted it to a single family dwelling. They did that by compartmentalizing these two large, large classrooms into uh, the four smaller ones, a uh, total of eight, as you see, and turned the entrance into kind of a foyer for the, school, for the house. It remained that way until 19 and until they returned it until 2013, which uh, this is the second time you hear the, the year 2013, which were it's an exciting year. Uh, in 2013, we were able to, we formed the foundation and we were able to purchase the property from the heirs of the, uh, of the home. And we were blessed in our property and that folks who lived here for all those many years 
took meticulous care of the building. So that put us kind of ahead of the game uh, as we move forward. We then have repurposed the building process of doing it. We've been slowed down by the, uh, the pandemic and getting work done. But we have returned this classroom into its original size. And that will be our display area. And keep in mind, the Rosenwald projects, the schools were both schools and community centers. And uh, that's an important aspect in terms of what we propose uh, for our building going forward. This will be an area where we can demonstrate what a school looks lo look like back in the day. Also, it can be converted to community activities. Uh, the other four we're leaving in their current size to be used as a special purpose area. For example, uh, one room has already been uh, kind of quasi claimed by the literacy account uh, committee. Uh, and that project would be a, where they could have a permanent home of doing that process. Uh, the building, uh, just a, one of the other rooms will be turned into a research area. We have a, uh, several uh, scholars and we formed a scholars committee. Several scholars who are uh, part of our group and we will hopefully be a center for well, let me change, hopefully, to intend to be a center for uh, significant research along the research uh, area of uh, the Rosenwell schools and education for African Americans in uh, general. Since I'm sharing my time with you, I'll end at this point showing you a bird's eye view of the school. This is where we sit right now. We, when we first began trying to save this. We said we needed to save it from the bulldozer. And the reason I say this, all of this area on both sides of us, along a major US highway, Highway 17, has been zoned commercial. And in fact, these hundred and some acres right here is a prime spot for a new business park. What we did early on, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to Colleen. We made a significant effort and successfully made it happen. We received, got our building made tax exempt by the county. And by doing that, we felt that the, the county had a reason to pr help protect us in this area. And we think that's going to be fairly well. We will attempt to, uh, this area you see right here is where Colleen is going to be talking to you. Uh, eventually, this will be a parking and service area as we go forward. And Colleen, you got it. Hey, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the archaeology that I have been doing at the site. If I can get my PowerPoint up. Oops, wrong. Sorry. All right, so I've been leading archeological excavations at the Woodville School for the past three years. Um, this is one of only four Rosenwald schools in the US that I know of that there's been any archeology span done. And I'm also digging at one of the other three in Gloucester as well. Schools in general, especially in the South and especially black schools, are not common targets for archaeology because there's this idea that they don't have much to offer archaeologically. My excavations at Woodville and the other two schools I've been digging at in Gloucester have been showing this really isn't true. In 2018, I completed a shovel test survey across the Woodville property, digging a small hole every 25 feet to see where concentrations of artifacts are. This showed a concentration of window glass and coal across the front yard area which became my first target. During 2019 and 2020, we've dug a total of 20 units around Woodville, largely in the front yard. These excavations were a combination of hired assistants, help from the local Fairfield Foundation, community volunteers, and a public dig day in early March 2020 that we just snuck in before the pandemic started. 
Um, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to have more of these public dig days. In the 11 units in the front yard, I found five post holes and three coal holes. The post holes are all different sizes and shapes, and it's not clear if they're, if they're related to each other or how or what they were from. The coal holes are literally that, holes filled with burned coal and what appears to be architectural debris, like bricks, roofing shingles, window glass, and nails. I have a picture of two of them up on the slide right now. They appear to have been filled in around 1923 when the Rosenwald School was constructed as the roofing shingles match the one on the school. Um, and this, the 1923 uh, building replaced an earlier 1886 school that was on the site. Most of the datable finds in the front yard come before 1923 and are associated with the earlier school. This, along with over 8,000 pieces of window glass and 360 pounds of coal found in this small area, suggests to me that the original school was probably located in this front yard, and that's what we're, I'm, I've been excavating. Wes agrees with me on this, sorry, Dr. Wilson. As to why there is so much unused coal in this area, even outside of the coal holes, that's also still a mystery I'm trying to figure out. Some of the artifacts have been found with dates on them, helping confirm the pre-1923 timeframe. The most notable was the celluloid notebook cover with a calendar from 1917 on it. The same notebook from 1915 can be found in the Smithsonian's collection. You can see what it would have looked like originally. It was taken to the DHR to be conserved. Um, there the conservators found a fingerprint on the back right here. Unfortunately, there isn't a way to figure out whose it was. The excavations have turned up many artifacts relating to schools on the site, including a stove leg, slate pencils and writing slate, erasers, pencil lead, and even some wooden pencils have survived. We also found a small piece of copper that says award for highest average. Some research showed that this was from a Celts Liberty Bell medal dating between 1903 and 1915. Teachers could send off to the Seltz Shoe Company in Chicago, and they would send uh, the school and the teachers these medals to free, for free to give out to the best students. We've been finding a lot of personal items, including a number of combs and this eyeglass lens. This slide shows only a, oh, this slide shows only a small selection of the buttons found across the site. They range from porcelain to glass to iron to a copper raincoat button and an imitation navy button. Similarly, there are glass beads everywhere on the site. Nearly every unit has had at least one bead, most more than one. This photo is only a small selection of the beads. Most of the ones on the slide were found right near one of the front doors of the Rosenwald School. There's also been a lot of jewelry found that all appears to date from the early 20th century. This includes a 14 karat gold pin that was found near the driveway. The unit the pin was found in only had a few other artifacts relating to the school, but this is the standard across the site. Everywhere we dug, we found something relating to the school, even if only in small quantities. Near the road, we found a pencil, a bead, and a button. And uh, near the privy foundations, we found the underwear style button. One of the artifact types I've been finding across all three schools I'm digging at are jelly jars turned into drinking glasses. Because there was no running water or water fountains, students would bring jars, especially these jelly jars, to school so they'd have water to drink. Um, the photo on the slide comes from the Bethel Rosenwald School in Gloucester in 1947 and shows a similar selection of jars being used for drinking. I quickly want to mention my excavations at Bethel because so far digging at Woodville has mostly turned up artifacts relating to the earlier 1886 school and not the Rosenwald period. Uh, there was only ever a Rosenwald on the Bethel site, and, so, and it's been chock full of artifacts, showing that it was definitely worthwhile to dig at Rosenwald schools, even the ones that were in use much later, as Bethel closed in 1951. I hope this is only the start of, for archaeology at Rosenwald schools, um, and as Woodville might be able to serve as somewhat of an example. While many are still standing, as you're hearing about today, even more are no longer standing, and archaeology can help us learn more about both standing and disappeared uh, Rosenwald schools. If you're interested in seeing more about what I've been finding or the other schools I've been digging at, um, please check out the Facebook or Instagram pages I have, and I will put those in the chat as well. Thank you.
Thank you both so much. Um, I think one thing you are doing is making me want to itch for ni nicer weather so we can get out and visit these places. Um, next, I'd like to invite Ms. Branch um, to the virtual screen. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Elizabeth and Sonia, for convening this Rosenwald Schools update during Black History Month. As both Black History and the Rosenwald Schools are commemorated because of the vis vision of two uh, very distinguished Black Virginians, renowned historian and author and founder of Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Whitson and Dr. Booker T. Washington, <clears throat> educator and president of uh, Tuskegee Institute, who with Julius Rosenwald um, developed the school building program for black students during the Jim Crow era. So it's very fitting that we are paying tribute to both of their legacies. As part of that celebration, I would like to take the liberty to begin my presentation by reading one stanza of Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as the Black National Anthem. And it was written by yet another legendary person, James Weldon Johnson. I wanna read that because it so eloquently speaks to the history of the Black struggle and for equality in America, yet the hope of our future. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, had not our weary feet come to the place which our father sighed? We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from a gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. First slide. Got it, Sonia. I'll continue by trying to give you some visual imagery <laughs> if uh, Sonia's unable. Threats to the Pine Grove School and community and other black communities in Virginia who gave birth to the Rosenwald schools and sustained them have always been present. Since its inception as a community, built by Black Americans in the late 1890s. As Reconstruction failed and whites in power sought to strip Blacks of every gain made during that time. So our community grew up with the threat that Jim Crow laws imposed on us as citizens, relegating us to second-class citizenship which also caused immeasurable economic, emotional, and educational hardships. Unfortunately, those threats are going on today and need to be addressed. Second slide. Dual threats. 
When the AMMD Family Association rescued Pine Grove School in May of 2018, we faced the threat of a deteriorating school building caused by years of neglect due to an aging population as well as illnesses and deaths of our predecessor, the Pine Grove Community Center, which rescued Pine Grove from sale at auction in 1964 and kept it as a functioning hub of the community uh, well into the 1990s. So in the beginning, we were faced with one threat, how to stabilize and restore our beloved school as a cultural center, which would again be the heartbeat of the community. A month later, we learned that a proposed mega field, landfill would be installed in the heart of our community. Now we were faced with two threats, one historic and one environmental. But right away we understood that there was this intersectionality between the two. There were, they were two sides of the same coin and could be traced back to institutionalized and systemic racism. Slide three. Mega landfill as proposed by the Greenwich Recycling and Disposal would cause irreparable harm to our historic, to the historic integrity of our community and its natural and cultural resources. To help you visualize 1,200 acres of trash, it would amount to 1,200 football fields of garbage piled as high as the Washington Monument sitting across from a historic site, Pine Grove. And in the midst of a pristine agricultural community, and to make matters worse, it won't even be our trash. They will be trucking and built from about 20 localities in the Northeast. Next slide. Stand up, speak out. As with any threat, you have to organize to fight it and you have to expose it for what it is. And that is what AMMD Pine Grove Project has done from the very beginning. My people have a history of doing just that. The NAACP was founded to fight racial and social justice, injustice. We organized to save our schooling community and to expose Green Ridge as a corporate polluter who thought they had picked the right spot <laughs> in the middle of a disenfranchised, poor, historically Black community with total disregard for our community's history and culture, which was on full display at the first hearing held in Cumberland in June, 2018, at which time I stood up and I spoke out to call attention to how they had neglected, they had completely disregarded us and had neglected to do any archeological work or any cultural studies of the site. Next. Displacement. One of the casualties of systemic racism has always been outward migration from black communities because of oppressive laws and lack of economic and educational opportunities. Pine Grove was victim of this system, was a victim of those systems and is suffering today with loss of our historic and cultural resources as you see pictured in this slide. Slide six. The human toll. 
it's bad enough to um, to see the displacement and destruction of buildings, but the displacement and the toll that this landfill is going to take on our people, uh, the displacement of people who sold out um, and who were able to sell out and, and sell their land and move away. So now those who are left are threatened to be displaced by toxic waste, which is being dumped on them. Slide, next slide. Pine Grove residents are totally dependent on well water and some of which would, uh, wells were dug at the turn of the century by their ancestors. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the toxins from the landfill is going to seep into the groundwater and compromise the health and safety of poor folks unable to uproot or move. The odor from the mountain of, of garbage will be unbearable, especially for residents and former students, like you saw in the previous slide, Cora Cook, who lives within yards of the proposed dump. Threats to historic and cultural resources. Recognizing threats to our history and culture, AMMD Pine Grove Project submitted a preliminary information form for the Pine Grove Rural Historic District in July 2020. Research and new collaborations are forming to revisit and revise the PIF to reflect a Black community which has been diminished because of unjust laws and racial in justice. We're taking an integrated approach to documenting our community and telling its story. The object of all of these corporate polluters, of course, is to divide the community. And so they have proposed to uh, reroute Pine Grove School, which is the corridor that has connected that community for over a century. Next slide. Our goal is to change the current preservation paradigm. And we are aggressively lobbying preservationists to value historic resources and cultural landscapes of indigenous and black communities through the lens of systemic racism, segregation and forced migration of the communities that built them. The other thing that we're hoping to accomplish is to offer apprenticeships, coursework and scholarships to students of color to pursue careers in architecture architectural history, anthropology, and archeology span through uh, HBCUs. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation and for all the work that you're doing to preserve Pine Grove. Um, there are several processes that are starting to happen at DEQ and we hope that they'll also be a section 106 process in the near future. So please stay in touch um, both through um, Pine Grove and Ms. Branch's work and also Preservation Virginia designated Pine Grove our, on our most endangered list last year. So as deadlines occur, we'll be sending out alerts so you can make public comment. Thank you. Um, next we'll have Curtis Valentine. 
Good morning, uh, and thank you for having me. I'm just going to share um, my screen if I could. And this is, um, and I don't, uh, I, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, our campaign to create a national park to, to Julius Rosenwald. And I'm going to, uh, I actually shared with you a link to the website. Uh, and I won't be long. I'm, I'm definitely interested in hearing some of the questions you all have. Uh, this campaign to recognize uh, Julius Rosenwald and the uh, thousands of African Americans who uh, really brought his and Booker T. Washington's business to fruition uh, began um, technically in 2015 um, with the energy that came about from uh, the Rosenwald film interview, I'm sure are familiar with uh, Bobby Viva Kempner. Uh, this uh, is an effort that I think um, many folks who have been uh, associated, affiliated with, knowledgeable of Rosenwald schools, uh, most likely would believe this is a long time coming. Um, but for me as a member of uh, the board, uh, it is uh, a recent discovery um, of mine. Uh, and I will kind of talk a little bit about what brought me to the campaign, where we are with the campaign, um, and, and how you all can, can get involved. What you see in front of you is a photograph of me standing in front of the Carol Boyd Rosenwald School in, in Bracey, Virginia, uh, where uh, my great grandparents, um, Beverly and Martha Valentine, and the people of Bracey, Virginia helped uh, to work with the um, St. Mark's Episcopal Church and the community of Bracey, Virginia uh, to, uh, to, to build this school. Um, and to move out of the St. Mark's Church where they were uh, previously educating African American and Indian, Indian American, Native American students. I discovered this building um, as a child, um, but uh, only recently realized it was a Rosenwald school. Uh, I'm originally from New Jersey. My father and his side of the family are both Valentines and Chavises from Mecklenburg County, uh, Virginia. Uh, and so the story comes about where I was looking for a photograph to put on a, an office wall. Here I live in Washington, D.C. in the, in the Maryland, D.C. metro area. Um, I'm on the Board of Education here in Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, and I was starting a new job and I wanted a photograph of a school that I could put on my wall because the work I do in my day job at the Progressive Policy Institute is really around how do we talk about um, governance in schools and how do you use school governance and school models to address educational inequities. And so I had an uncle who uh, was born and raised in Bracey, Virginia, moved to New York and then uh, moved back. He said, well, Curtis, the school, there's a school right there. You can take a photograph of it if you, if you like. And I said, what school? He said, the school right next to the church. Um, and I said, well, no, that's an old shed. I'm, I'm talking about a school. He said, well, Curtis, that is the Carroll Boy School. That's where I attended school. That's where your grandfather, Levi, attended school. And so this is a school, if you're looking for a school to photograph, I jumped in my car and the photograph you see on the bottom is me literally 10 minutes after hearing a story from um, my, uh, my cousin, Willie Valentine. And so the top uh, photograph is of the school in roughly 1933. It was started in 1926 um, by the same founder of uh, uh, Mr. Solomon, who actually also founded St. Paul College um, in, in Lawrenceville. And so there is a connection, as you, most of you know, between Rosenwald schools and historically uh, black colleges. And so this discovery came only a few months after I even heard the word uh, and the name of Julius Rosenwald. Um, as a Board of Education member in Prince George's County, Maryland, there is a Rosenwald School in Capitol Heights, which is called the Ridley Rosenwald School. I was asked to come and speak and give Black History Month comments. Um, and only then did I find out who Julius Rosenwald was. I eventually met Stephanie Deutsch, who's the author of um, A United Schoolhouse, which is the kind of the one of the seminal books on Julius Rosenwald. Uh, her son, Julius Rosenwald's great grandson, was there, um, and we just talked about Rosenwald and the history of, of philanthropy and Booker T. Washington and the growth and connection to historically black college. I'm a graduate of Morehouse College, so very very important to me. Nevertheless, you know, uh, my personal connection as a descendant of a, of a founder uh, really uh, sparked the, um, the, the the advisory board and the and the board. Of Parks campaign, which had already started um, years before I got affiliated, to me to for me to join, and through the efforts of this group to bring about uh, legislation in Congress 
to introduce um, a, a bill to examine and study the uh, likelihood, the potential um, for uh, a, a, a series of national park, which actually on six different sites. One seminal site in Chicago, which would recognize um, Julius Rosenwald and the location of that is, is will, will be part of that study. Uh, there are various locations, whether it be the Rosenwald uh, apartments, um, the uh, and other locations that are associated with Sears Roebuck. Um, as many of you know, uh, uh, the, the, the business that, that, that he ran. Uh, but there will be five other locations throughout the country. Our, our group um, and a very big part of the work that we are doing is doing our own research and going out, uh, many, many of the committee members going out throughout the country and identifying Rosenwald schools that, that we believe would be good examples of what a, um, a, a park would look like. And we have a rubric, we, there, there's some examination of, of that, and we were able to sort of submit a list to um, uh, the um, national parks, uh, and they are going to use that list to uh, examine and call to, the, to, to sort of come about with, an exit, with a recommendation to Congress um, on what those would look like. We were so uh, lucky to into have introduced a bill just last year uh, and in our first year, get bipartisan support um, in, on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate uh, to introduce this um, and to pass it uh, with Representative Danny Davis from Chicago um, on, on the House side. Uh, that was really, really helpful in pushing this forward. And one of the last bills that uh, President Trump signed before leaving office was the 2020 uh, Rosenwald um, uh, Parks uh, legislation. So we were very, very excited about that. That legislation will, um, uh, will direct the, uh, the Parks Department to, National Parks to uh, begin the examination and process of, of making a recommendation about the likelihood of a national park. I, I, um, I put in the, into the comments, again, the, um, into the chat, uh, a, a link for those who want to get involved, to sign up, to receive information about uh, where we are with the campaign, where we are with fundraising. One of the um, next steps will have to be once we uh, hopefully get approval for the park that we will begin in earnest to fundraise for um, uh, a very big part of the uh, the, the actual edifice and everything that will go about in recognizing these, these schools. Um, and so for me as an ascendant, as someone who works in education policy in my, in my day job, someone who really talks about the history of education of African-Americans and to have had this discovery that you see in front of you, um, it's incredibly important. It, you can see, you know, um, just through this photograph, the life uh, and the energy uh, that took place in that school ab ab above. And uh, when I show this photograph to my, to my cousins who actually attended this school, uh, they have very, very fond memories. But it's important that not only, you know, that the, that the country knows the history of these schools, of those who, you know, really did a, um, a yeoman's job in really bringing these schools together. You all know the Rosenwald funding model where one third of the money came from the Rosenwald Fund and one third came from local school district and one third came from the community. And so these communities will finally be recognized um, with the National Park. Uh, I'll just in, in con conclude, this will be a historic park because it will be the first uh, National Park dedicated to a Jewish American in American history. And so to be a, uh, associated with this uh, in this campaign uh, and to really, you know, sort of uh, recognize the legacy of my ancestors and other ancestors to bring about these schools uh, is incredibly important to me. And so to have had this legislation passed in the first year, to have uh, the, um, the, the support we have from our board members, from the African-American community, from the Jewish American community, from those who are in the conservation space to really come together. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I'm um, optimistic about what we can accomplish uh, moving forward. So thank you so much for having me and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are, uh, Thrilled to have you with us and thrilled for the news that this has been a success and look to support that. Uh, next, we have Justin Reed from the Virginia Humanities. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna be really quick and try to 
give us some time here. So um, today I've, I've been invited to the panel to discuss some, some resources that are available. And um, what I wanted to do is, is I'll take the opportunity to, to preview an online resource that has not yet been launched um, officially. Um, it is live, but um, there are gonna be some things you see, it'll say private, meaning it's, it's still um, kind of behind the scenes and it'll be unveiled to the public pretty soon. Uh, Let's see, I'm guessing everybody can, can see the screen now. So in, in 2018, uh, we launched the Virginia African American Cultural Resources Task Force. And this was an initiative um, that was legislated um, through the General Assembly, uh, Delegate Dolores McQuinn in Richmond uh, introduced this legislation. It was unanimously passed um, by the General Assembly. And it essentially created a coalition of, of state agencies and statewide nonprofits to uh, come together and, to, and to talk about and how we can better support uh, efforts to preserve Virginia's Black cultural heritage. And out of these conversations, um, we've begun to um, think about ways that, that we could better support grassroots efforts. And from that conversation, one of the outcomes has been uh, this this website that you see right here called called Afro Virginia. Um, and I'll, I'll just pre preview parts of it. Um, really, the goal of this site is to help share the stories of, of preservation, uh, Black community organizing that's happening all across the state. Um, and so you'll see, I mean, this, this is in, in Lee County, this feature story here uh, on the main page. Um, but we also have stories, uh, Muriel Branch and, and the work that she's doing um, in Pine Grove. Uh, we have a work that's happening in, in Jamestown. These are some of the, the, the example stories that uh, people will be able to find um, when they visit the website here. So there aren't any events listed right now, um, but what you'll eventually be able to see once it's live is you'll um, have a, a, almost like a one-stop shop to learn about events from our, our state agencies that are, are working to preserve this history. And so it's uh, Virginia Humanities, it's Virginia Tourism, uh, you have uh, DHR, Virginia Outdoors Foundation, uh, uh, Preserva Preservation Virginia is uh, our statewide uh, preservation nonprofit, um, also Virginia Africana As Associates. Um, so you know, when each of these organizations have any special events that are um, devoted to promoting uh, Black cultural resources, uh, the goal is to be able to um, direct people to those, those websites and to those events um, through this page here. Uh, and so again, you'll have some of the news and, and stories uh, featured um, on this website. Um, so we are compiling resources. So these are, these are three examples I think are, are fairly well known um, when it comes to funding. Um, but another goal of ours is to also um, include resources that are uh, um, scholarly articles that may, may be helpful or um, you know, reading text that, that might be able to help introduce uh, the public to you know, historic preservation policy. I mean, the goal really is, is to make all of these resources as accessible as possible. Um, so you don't have to have you know, a master's degree in, in preservation, a PhD in architectural history in order to advance the work you're trying to do in the community. Um, we really want to ensure that uh, you know, the cultural heritage community is is open to, to anyone who who is working to to say you know, what matters to them. Um, and I will say, in the spirit of of accessibility, uh, Virginia Humanities. I think many people on the call have probably applied um, to Virginia Humanities in the last almost fifty years uh, for a grant. Um, we are working to to overhaul our own grant making processes to ensure that they are, are more accessible. Um, and more equitable. And so I, I ask everyone to, to bear with us this year as we in, improve um, our, our systems. Because again, um, you know, we've, we found that in many cases there are unnecessary barriers and we want to remove as many of those barriers as possible um, when it comes to awarding funding. Um, so um, one of the things that I'm, I'm most excited about um, on, on the website um, is this page right here. Uh, 
it says private, but uh, next Friday it'll be live. Um, so as 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 Mrs. Branch mentioned, you know, there's there's, there's a huge need to uh, really mentor and support the, the next generation of of Black uh, cultural heritage practitioners, and a lot of that mentorship. Um, is, is going to be coming from those who are already in the field. It's, I mean, it's imperative that that mentorship is, is coming from the field. And it's important that the next generation sees individuals who look like them who are already um, in the profession. And so what we've created, um, and really this is this is a, a, a growing list, so this is definitely not um, you know completed, but um, what we've done is we've be begun compiling a list of, of people who've already supported the work of the task force, who are partners that we've already uh, turn to for, for various projects. Um, so not only will, will um, local community members be able to go to this page and um, find perhaps someone they can connect with with a particular question, um, but college students, high school students, you know, visiting this page will again be able to see individuals who look like them and hopefully be inspired um, to begin to consider this as a, as a potential career opportunity. Um, and so one feature that, um, let's see here, I can show it. Maybe, maybe because I'm in the dashboard setting. So one of the features um, that's not appearing now, um, but um, when it's live, you'll be able to see is you can actually search individuals based on location, um, also by um, area of expertise. And then when you um, click on uh, a particular page, you'll see a short bio along with um, a website and their contact information. So the, the places page here um, is really showcasing a, a map that was developed um, about a decade ago that's um, continuously being improved. Uh, but one thing that we've done is we, we've um, allowed people to see some of the, the cultural heritage sites um, related to, to Black history um, across the state. And so um, we're, you know, we're having conversations now uh, with co coalition members, with task force members about how, how we can ensure that the information on this site can be easily transported um, to what uh, the Department of Historic Resources has or the work that Preservation of Virginia is, is doing. Um, but this is, this is one way um, we can begin to highlight some of the things that are happening around the state. And then this just really breaks down some of the history of, of the task force. Um, you know, when it was established, um, its members, its mission. Um, as you see right here, the mission is to champion inclusive learning, community development, economic opportunities through the preservation of Black culture heritage. Um, and again, we're attempting to do that through resource and information sharing. So a big part of that resource and information sharing is the development of this site that, you know, that makes preservation work more, more accessible, um, more engaging, you know, by focusing on the people and the stories behind this work. Um, outreach to um, communities, but also to um, our, our colleges. Um, the task force includes representation from our two public historic black colleges, Virginia State University and Norfolk State University, um, and also education. Um, you know, we have had um, some events at our historic black colleges, but we also realize that you know, education isn't just limited to students. You know, we're all lifelong learners. Um, our, our legislators have to continue their education when it comes to these issues, and so that's going to be an important goal going forward. And so I will stop right there because I see we're running out of time. But um, again, next Friday, um, look out for the announcement because um, we'll be making all this information live. Thank you so much for sharing this important work with us, Justin. Um, we will now hear from Megan Brown. And if we, um, we're running a little bit over, so if we don't get to your questions today, we will make sure that we get them um, uh, to answers to you in some follow-up emails. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Get my screen shared here. Oh. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. 
Yeah, so I will I will try to go really quick here. Uh, let's see. So we're going to talk about some grant programs today that the National Park Service has available um, that you may be able to tap into for any of these wonderful Rosenwald schools. Um, they're, one, they're one of my favorite resources. I've been working with them off and on for 20 plus years. Um, so I'm excited that we may have some, some ways to help you uh, with them. So we're gonna quickly touch on the Historic Preservation Fund that the National Park Service manages. And this is money that comes from offshore oil lease revenue. The idea that if we're, being, we're destroying one resource and we're putting that funding back into the preservation of other cultural resources. So it's not tax dollars, which I think is kind of an important thing to talk about. Um, there's two basic, <coughs> excuse me, sides to the fund. There's non-competitive programs that fund our states and our tribes, tribal offices every year. And then there's the competitive side. We're gonna spend our time on the competitive side this morning, but I do want you to be aware of on the non-competitive side, every state is required to give out 10% of their funding to certified local governments. Now, if you don't know, if you are a certified local government or not, you can come to our website here and find out. Also work with the Virginia State Office to figure that out. Um, but this might be a resource. These are not big grants, but they can do wonderful things. So a lot of planning work, um, maybe some structural stabilization, those types of things. So I just want you to be aware that is the pot of money that we pretty much have available every year, but you do need to be a certified local government. So these are the um, competitive grant programs that we have. We're not going to talk about all of them today, but the ones that I think may be most um, related to the work y'all are doing. And you all should have gotten a fact sheet on the program. So hopefully the, the nitty gritty details that I'm going to race through, um, you will have that information and know where to find out more about it. So our African-American Civil Rights Program, um, really one of our most robust programs, exciting. We fund both preservation to historic buildings as well as history projects. So, you know, we're talking a lot about preserving the stories and um, what has happened that a lot of, I was watching a show last night and a lot of that is an oral tradition um, and that, that we're losing those people that have those stories. So we do a lot of oral histories. Um, we can do national register nominations, surveys, uh, any planning types of activities. We've done some exhibits. So think, think broadly when you're thinking of that history side of things. Now, if you need to do structural work, we've funded several Rosenwald schools. Um, this program has opened up to include all African American civil rights and the struggle to, for equality from transatlantic slave trade forward. It used to focus just on the civil rights movement in the 20th century, but that has since broadened. The other thing we've done is broaden those history grants to include collections. So if you have a, um, a photography collection or an oral history collection that's on old videotapes or um, ar archival collection, this might also be a place for you to look. Um, the grants for 2020 just closed in January, um, but we have $16.7 million available for 2021. And those applications will be available this fall. There is no match required for this um, and grants go up to half a million dollars. So this is a wonderful opportunity, um, especially for Rosenwald schools to take advantage of. Um, a spinoff of this program is our History of Equal Rights program. So this just does the preservation work like civil rights does, um, but, but can encompass any American civil rights struggle. So we do have some African-American civil rights grants have applied for this, um, projects have applied for this. Um, but it can also include other things. Uh, the struggle for women's right to vote is pictured here. Um, tribal you know, issues, uh, anything, Hispanic. Uh, so uh, we have uh, two, two million to give away this year. We'll have three million again uh, for 2021, same deadline, fall, um, and no match required for that. Story of Black Colleges and Universities, clearly a strong connection with the Rosenwald Schools, and we've talked about it a little bit today. This is a, a program we've had for a long time, since 2006. Um, we have 10 million to give away right now. Those applications are on grants.gov, and we fund National Register properties on HBCU campuses. Um, and we do physical preservation work to those. So it's a little bit smaller perimeter, but 
there might be a connection um, and you all might be also working on other projects, I have a feeling. Um, those applications are due the end of March and we will have an additional 10 million available for fiscal year 2021. Again, no match required on these. Um, this is a, a fairly new program we have and it's really the intent is to fund a program. Um, and so you're applying for a chunk of money then to give out to other communities, but it might be something like uh, a state or a county might wanna apply and then work on several Rosenwald schools at once. So this one's a little bit complicated, a little hard to understand. So if you're thinking about something like that, do call our office and talk to us about that. But we do have funding available coming up for it. Um, Save America's Treasures is a longstanding program that we've had. Um, funds nationally significant buildings and collections. We've done work with this program on the uh, Rosenwald School collection at Fisk. Um, we've worked on Rosenwald schools with it before. I think there certainly is a national story to be told with these. Um, it has some little more sticky parameters um, with it. It does require match. We can only fund one project uh, um, ever. So uh, if you're looking at this, uh, you know, again, talk to us more about it, but um, we will have 25 million available in fiscal year 2021. Um, I heard a couple of you talk about working on national register nominations. Our underrepresented community program does that. So we do surveys. Um, and then nominations, or we amend other National Register nominations. We talked a little bit this, about this on our practice session, that there's a lot of places listed out there that maybe only tell part of their history, right? So that, that white man part of history. So it was left out, African-American left out, women, like those types of things. So um, as far as changing that look of the National Register, we certainly could uh, amend those nominations. And this is a place that this program can help with. So just so you're aware of that one too. And then we have a new grant program. I can't really tell you much about it because we haven't quite figured it out yet, but it's actually to preserve state-owned sites and structures. So if you did know of state-owned properties that are associated, um, that you're working with, with the, within the African-American community, this may be a place for um, funding as part of the 250th celebration of the founding of the nation. Um, and then we also have emergency funding that's available and this runs through our state offices. Jim Hare is uh, very involved in this. Um, and we did, Virginia did receive funding um, for the Florence uh, UT Michael storm. So that's another place if you did have a, a school or a connection to a property that had damage from one of those storms, um, get in touch with DHR and, and talk to them about those grants that might be available. The last thing I have, and I know I'm over time, is y'all had asked for some advice on grant writing. So just real quickly, um, these are kind of my top 10 um, things of advice. Um, deadlines, they're real. Uh, start early. Don't ask for extensions. We, have, we get hundreds of grant applications and that's a very hard thing for us to do. Keep it simple. Don't worry about the appearance of your uh, documents. Most of ours are online anyway, but uh, don't, don't worry too much about the binder clips. Um, make sure you're using the current application form when you use last year's. That's a, a red flag for us. Check your math. Uh, sometimes it doesn't add up quite right. Um, don't be the only set of eyes. Let someone else read that application and make sure they understand it. Um, make sure you explain everything. You may be too close to the project and you might need that other set of eyes to help say, hey, I'm not quite getting this. Um, make sure your project's eligible. That's why we have staff. You call us, talk to us, get those answered questions answered. Um, and then don't, don't just include lots of information. Get focused. Um, less is more uh, for someone who's reading 100 plus grant applications. Um, and photos are important. So it's lovely if you take a really pretty picture of your building, but we want to see where the damage is. We want to uh, see that the water is pouring in the roof. So go out in the rain, take pictures of the mold, those types of things. Um, and then finally, start early. Uh, for federal grants, you have to use grants.gov. It requires a lot of different systems that some take up to four weeks to get signed up in. So please, please uh, start early. Um, and just remember to be nice to your grant manager. This is where to find more information on us at the Park Service. Um, we answer our email and our phone line every day. Uh, so if you have more information, need more information, you've got the fact sheets and this is how you find us. And that's all. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Funding is so important. And these uh, sources are extremely, they've accomplished significant work, uh, not only in Virginia, but around the country. So thank you for sharing that. And to talk a little bit more about funding, uh, we have Luana Holland um, Moore with us. So Luana, you may be on mute still. There we go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, let's switch this over. Great. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Luana Holland Moore. I'm the Associate Program Officer for the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. We were created in 2017 in response to um, certain events that had happened around that time. As you can see on the left, um, the photo of Mother Emanuel, AME in Charleston, the site of um, the massacre by a white supremacist. On the right, you can see the vandalization of African Meeting House in Nantucket. But the true inspiration for why we came to be were the events that happened in 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia. The Action Fund is a multi-year, $25 million initiative. And on this page, you can, on the slide, you can see our advisory committee, our very active advisory committee as comprised of uh, many African-American luminaries such as Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation, actress Felicia Rashad, secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, and they are very involved. But I know we uh, have a time constraint, so let's go ahead and talk about the action fund itself. The Action Fund hopes to draw attention to the remarkable and still largely unrecognized um, stories and um, of and places of ac African American activism and achievement. African American history is American history, and through the elevation of these stories, we help to contribute to that collective narrative. We just wrapped up year three um, uh, in terms of our announcements for our grant program itself. And we're now entering year four. Um, we've received over 500 LOIs this year um, requesting um, over $53 million. Um, and so far we have awarded um, we've awarded 1. Point, excuse me, $4.3 million to 65 sites nationwide. Um, we do this in four categories, capital projects, which is your bricks and mortar, programming and interpretation, project planning and organizational capacity, such as uh, board training, um, governance, um, we hope that this, this will enable organizations and historic sites to be able to accomplish their goals. And as you can see in this picture, um, this is Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, New York. And um, it's been really fulfilling to be able to help these organizations to be able to move forward with their projects. Another um, thing that the Action Fund funds is the National Trust has historic sites and we have funded 10 projects so far that help these sites to reinterpret and reimagine these sites. This, this was a jazz program at the Woodrow Wilson House. We've also funded a playwright, Aoife Baeza, at Shadows in the Tesh in Louisiana. You can see here that um, Taco Bottom, and this is one of our, considered one of our national treasures. We have 11 campaigns and that includes um, Shaco Bottom, Nina Simone House, Polly Murray House, 
um, the AG Gaston Motel attention to these sites and share those stories. We also are involved with our HOPE crew, which stands for Hands-On Preservation Experience. And this involves um, youth groups and volunteers um, to come together to help restore our sites. We hope that it will inspire a new generation of tradespersons and involvement in the historic preservation trades. Just this week, and we're really proud about this, we announced the winners, excuse me, the awardees of our HBCU initiative. Um, two HBCUs received um, campus -wide funding for campus-wide preservation plans and six received funding for um, individual structure and site preservation plans. We also offer preservation leadership trainings for sites and organizations to learn more about board training, governance, organization, um, organization governance. And we also maintain a fellows program. We're entering year three um, with, in which we encourage different ways to think about preservation and new innovative ways. And this includes um, Brianna Rhodes, the editorial, and Daisy Taylor, who's a Green Book Scholar, Yorba Rishan, who is a filmmaker, and Jenna Dublin, who helped to head up our Equity Report project. The Equity Report itself, Preserving African American Places, was released this year and um, talks about gentrification, displacement, and the 10 fellows you see on the right helped to contribute to Feet on the Ground um, examinations of 10 cities across the country. Another huge part of what we do is to offer technical assistance to African-American historic sites and organizations. One of the best parts of my job is answering the phone. And I love talking to the public about what they can do to help save their sites, whether it's getting historic markers or just I have a property or I have a Rosenwald school on my property. What do I do next? <laughs> and as you can see, you know, I've actually received more than 100 inquiries at this point. And it is truly one of my favorite parts of my job is talking to the public. It often leads to um, being able to help even save whole, whole communities. Um, this is a picture of Brockway, um, the Brockway Mansion in Oklahoma City, which for demolition and they gave us a call and I was like, okay, let me help you out. <laughs> we also love Rosenwald. I like to tell people when they're applying for one of our grants that your small Rosenwald in your rural location has just as much of a chance as the Birmingham Civil Rights National Monument. Um, as you can see pictured here on the left, is the Mays Lick Rosenwald in Mays Lick, Kentucky. And they were one of our 2020 awardees. And on the right is the Mars Hill Rosenwald in Mars Hill, North Carolina. And it was one of our 20, I believe it was 2018, one of our first. Um, in the corner, you can see our publication, Preserving Rosenwald Schools, which is really a fantastic resource. And I love telling people to go to our website, savingplaces.org backslash Rosenwall, and you can find it there. It's in PDF, so you can take a look at it. It's a really great resource in terms of telling you all about Rosenwalls and what you can do to help preserve a Rosenwald school in your area. And just for my last slide in general, um, Doing this work means that we are able to tell a full American story, to share these untold stories and to bring recognition and identification to places and sites that may have otherwise been overlooked. And that is one of the great things about this fund is being able to do that work. Thank you. Oh, actually, um, I also want to say too, that in terms of funds, there is other funding available outside of the Action Fund as well. If you also, you can send an email to grants at savingplaces.org because there's also preservation funds available. 
um, in the supply state. So for instance, if you're applying from Virginia, it would be drawn from funds for Virginia. And there's also funding such as the Mitchell and Favreau Fund that's available as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, this is an exciting topic and you know why we can spend an entire day when we can gather in person and still uh, run out of time. We are running over and uh, so what we, were, what we plan to do is to respond to your questions in our follow-up. Um, we'll work with our panelists to get specifics and respond to those questions um, so we can be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, but we do appreciate everyone's participation today. It really shows the tremendous grassroots effort that's going on in Virginia to save these very vital places of memory. Um, our board chair, Jenny Keller, had to sign off for another meeting, but she wanted me to extend her appreciation um, to each of our panelists and to all of you that have attended today. Um, stay safe, uh, stay warm. Um, spring is coming and we'll all be out on the road to visit these very special places. So thank you for attending and look forward to seeing you at some of our programming that's coming up. Take care. Bye. Thank you.